You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT, 95.7 FM in Davis, California. Low power, high impact radio. I'm Autumn Labe Renault, and today is Friday, May 15th. We are sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. The show airs live at noon on Tuesdays and Fridays and repeats at 5 p.m. both days and at noon on Sundays. You can also check in anytime online at kdrt.org. My guests today are Yolo County Supervisor for District 3, Gary Sandy, and Wendy Kunta, who is the Executive Director of Progress Ranch, a nonprofit that runs two group homes in Davis. And we will get to those interviews in just a couple of minutes. Well, it's been a week that's brought a little bit of clarity, but even more confusion about the process of reopening, plus continued troubling economic and political news, and for many of us, too much time in front of a computer. I literally ran outside yesterday morning when I heard neighbors chatting in their front yards. I knew I'd be on Zoom for the next four hours, and I just wanted that in-person contact from an appropriate distance, of course. I felt like a complete dork, but bless my sweet neighbors, they laughed with me and not at me. My social media feeds are full of that yearning for connection as well, and the conundrum, of course, is how to cultivate that in ways that keep us safe. So I've mentioned this before, but there are a million stories out there about how that yearning and connection and just what gets us through our days, and we really want to hear yours. Take a look at davismedia.org slash diary to learn about our life in the time of COVID, the Yolo County Community Diary Project. And then upload your very brief video to help us paint a picture of our local communities during this time. It's easy. It can be silly or serious. You don't even need to be on camera. You can take a picture of your garden. And it does not have to be anything approaching perfection. Check it out. And our listener Lois wrote in with a few more tips on the lighter side. She reminded me about the great teddy bear hunt that continues throughout Yolo County, something that started back in April. Basically, people are placing their teddy bears in visible places in their homes or parked cars so that kids can find them on scavenger hunts. And they're having all kinds of fun with this. The bears can be moved from week to week to up the challenge. Want to learn more? Check out Yolo County Teddy Bear Hunt on Facebook. And with face coverings required, a number of neighbors throughout the county are making them. If you are in need of handmade masks or if you are making masks, there is a Facebook group, Yolo County Mask Making for COVID-19. And you can also find offers for them for free on the Nextdoor app. One local nonprofit, Davis Phoenix Coalition, has been making rainbow and batik masks and selling them as a fundraiser at Davis Farmer's Market. Many other folks, including some of my neighbors and friends, are making them and just giving them away as a labor of love, and we thank you for that. And while our usual gathering places are closed, some creative leaders have figured out ways to share using Zoom and other online methods. Uh, for example, Debbie Ernice, and ironically, that's my guest Wendy's mom, um, managed to get almost 100 Fit for Life exercises Zooming, and they've been going since April the Davis Genealogy Club will be offering its first ever online presentation on May 26th about DNA genetic genealogy research. And the Davis Senior Center is hosting regular social chats to help keep folks connected. You can learn more about these last three items I mentioned via the Davis Senior Center. Call them at 530-757-5696 or email services at cityofdavis.org. And finally, if you haven't already checked it out, the Folk Brothers are back on the air Wednesday mornings. Bill Wagman and Peter Schiffman are working from home, producing their show that includes traditional folk of the British Isles and the United States, contemporary singer-songwriters on both sides of the Atlantic, and American roots music and some of its lesser-known offshoots. It's a great show. Listen live Wednesdays at 10 a.m. or catch the archive on kdrt.org. And we're going to take just a minute for music before our first call.
He served as a member of the Woodland City Council from 1989 to 1996, including two years as its mayor. And he has a storied resume of other community service, plus work in the state uh, as a state legislative staffer and various posts at UC Davis. In 2018, he was elected to the Yolo County Board of Supervisors for District 3 and currently serves as the board's chair. My first guest today is Gary Sandy. Hi there, Gary. Welcome. Good afternoon. So how are things in, in your world during the pandemic? How are you and your family doing okay? Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Gary, can you hear me? Okay, folks, Hello. We're ha can you hear me? We're having a technical difficulty. Hang on. Gary, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to go back to the music and see if we can get him on the air again. Okay, we're going to try this again. Gary, can you hear me? I can. All Thank right. You. Hopefully you heard the, the nice introduction I gave you there a few minutes ago. <laughs> I, heard, I, I did hear that part. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> very Good. nice of you. Good. Well, um, so I, I've been talking to a lot of people, uh, you know, over the last couple of months from the county, uh, your, your board of supervisors, colleagues, many people from public health. So we've talked a lot about the the impacts of the pandemic, um, you know, kind of through the county lens. But last week, the state announced it would allow for regional variation, essentially an opportunity for counties to move uh, further into phase two and reopen additional services or businesses. But they have to meet criteria and they have to have a, a readiness plan. So two questions to start off. How is Yolo County responding to this and what is our level of readiness? Well, we said in our what's called our letter of attestation yesterday to the state, which basically says we want to enter into this and uh, begin moving ahead. And so we now have to wait and see whether they will approve that. And uh, as you may know or may remember, uh, one of the, the problems is that they want counties to have gone 14 days without a death. Mm -hmm. And due to the presence of long-term care or skilled nursing facilities in the county, that's a tougher threshold to meet because the uh, the incidence of death is, is just much higher associated with those facilities. Sure. So that sets us back some. But we'll wait and see what happens. Right. In terms of other, uh, let's talk about the, the contact tracers for a minute. I know there's a threshold there, a certain number a county needs to have. I think it was... 30 for Yolo County, but we're training more. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. We have 37 trained at the moment. We're trying to reach a threshold, an upper threshold of 60, mm -hmm. so that we can uh, give us greater mobility. But actually, the tracing and the testing are the two key elements of moving forward in a manner that, that safeguards public health. And so we're finally there. Right. Right. Well, this week brought um, some more uh, some more items have opened up, and I'm just going to read that list. Uh, child care for those outside of the essential workforce. That that's a big deal. Uh, it is a huge deal. Yeah, limited services including car washes, pet grooming, landscape gardening, appliance repair, uh, residential <laughs> and janitorial cleaning and plumbing outdoor museums and open gallery spaces. So we are gradually starting to see those things open up where we can still have some reasonable assurance of, of distance, but we don't really know when we're gonna get to stage three, do we? That's a question people have been asking me. We do not, and stage three is really gonna be the big stage. At this point, we're still dealing with things where we can pretty, where either people have limited contact with others uh, that stage two contains a lot of outdoor activities that we've been trying to work on, mm -hmm. but stage three will be the biggie. Uh, stage three just incorporates the um, so much of the other elements, higher risk businesses, including uh, nail and hair salons, mm -hmm. where people are very close to each other. Gyms, gyms I think are a major hurdle. Movie theaters and sports uh, with sure. live audiences. And, of course, in-person religious services, which has been another significant barrier awaits us in Stage 3. 
Yeah, and then of course there's the concern that we could pass through stage three, reopen a bunch of things, and then deal with a, a seasonal outbreak again in the fall. We don't we don't know, but that's that's one of the potentials. So that's been one of the reasons that I've been more of a fan of moving ahead at this point, mm -hmm. when the relative level of contact between people is is better spaced. People are outside; they're moving around; they're maintaining an active lifestyle. And I wanted us to learn our lessons now, then wait until the fall when people begin to go inside in their enclosed contained spaces where the spread of the virus uh, can happen more quickly. And so I've been rather anxious to get us out there and so we can start learning our own best practices mm -hmm. in anticipation of, of changed habits in the fall. Well, more and more it does seem that the, the number one practice we'll have to continue is wearing masks. So. I, I just read a piece about, you know, all the different places you can find them in Yolo County. Um, let's talk about the budgetary impact on the county, Gary. Um, so I, I checked in with yesterday's May budget revise from the state, and it had a lot of uh, hits for education. But we know the news going forward for municipalities is, is going to be pretty dire, too. So how will the county approach those challenges, and where will it hit hardest? Well, the, well, the county is currently staring down the barrel of a $13.1 million shortfall, so it is not insignificant, and mm -hmm. the fiscal challenges are really going to color a lot of the conversation um, well into the fall here. Uh, they pose major, obviously, major barriers to us moving forward, but we will try to do our best to balance those. We're discussing where we can cut now and what we can what we can do uh, in the interim and taking this time to sort of look at things from a strategic viewpoint. Mm -hmm. We did re receive some welcome news from the May revise, which is that we received a, uh, a $22 million um, COVID response payment. Uh, and so that will help uh, moving forward with any COVID related um, costs, but it's going to be a very, very tough year budgetarily. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. As I've been talking with people from the city, we're hearing about things like, you know, hiring freezes, not filling positions, sure. having to go back uh, with collective bargaining units. So is the county looking at, we'll be looking at similar things as well? We will be looking at the full retinue of, of, of potential cuts and ways that we can best manage our workforce um, without obviously um, cutting our workforce. We're going to mm -hmm. do everything we can possible to maintain it. Uh, but it is going to be it is going to be a difficult time with difficult decisions. Right. I I want to thank you. I've thanked other supervisors too, but for your work in uh, steering the opening of the Yolo County Relief Fund for nonprofits. That's as I sit here, you know, I manage this nonprofit. It, that's been a big deal for all of us to help shine a light on that. So I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for that. Good. We're looking at a partnership there with Travis uh, Federal Credit Union that may increase our uh, our year-to-date total upward of eight hundred thousand. We have about four hundred thousand in the bank, and they've agreed to match it. Excellent. So we uh, may be up nearing a million dollars at this point. That's good news. I also wanted to ask you how Woodland is faring. You're a long, long time resident of Woodland and, and former mayor, and deeply involved. And I, I haven't really had a chance to kind of touch in on. Uh, any with anyone from Woodland yet. So how's your community doing? Well, one of the most fascinating aspects of being on the board is, and ha having met someone who lived in Davis for several years mm -hmm. and then moved to Woodland um, has been just noting the cultural differences on the board and how the different supervisors approach issues, how they are pressured by the public, etc. Mm -hmm. Woodland is keenly feeling the pressure of the shutdown in ways that I'm not sure the other communities are principal because it has such a large and vibrant business section, sector, mm, mm -hmm. and many of those are mom and pop shops uh, for which the, uh, the shutdown has been very severe and is now threatening their businesses. They've obviously laid off employees, so there's a lot of very evident and vocal, um, to their credit, um, sharing of the way that this has all impacted those businesses. and so. Uh, there's been just a big push from Woodland um, in that regard. Let's reopen. Let's get people moving again. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's really been, I think, a different aspect from the other supervisors. 
Yeah, I'm just visualizing Main Street in downtown Woodland, sure. and um, you know, I've I go out uh, before the shutdown. I go I go out there frequently, and uh, you know, avail of of different services out there, state theater and some restaurants and and things sure. like that, and. I've really noticed over the last couple of years, there's been like this renewed vigor in, in downtown Woodland and it's become this really kind of cool place. Uh -huh. So, so not only are you, are you talking about those businesses though, you're talking about Woodland has a lot of um, light industry and, and right. uh, warehouse facilities and things that you're, you're right. right. Davis doesn't really have those. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, the, the business sector in Woodland, as I said, is very vibrant in the, I have often said that, that in very many ways that Woodland serves as the marketplace for Davis. And I would say, if you don't believe me, visit Target on a Saturday morning mm -hmm. when it seems like half of Davis is there. Um, but it, it has been, it's a shame that at a time when, when Woodland was sort of finally regaining its stride that it lost perhaps in the 50s and 60s around economic vitality downtown, now this has given it a whammy. And this, this looming development of, of nice new restaurants and entertainment venues downtown, much of which is still in the planning stages, may now never come to fruition. And that's, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. So how do we begin to help businesses rebuild? Rebuild is maybe the wrong word because what you just said indicates that some of them simply won't survive this you know there's going to right. be a lot of collateral damage but how how does a community come together and start addressing that for example what role is your chamber of commerce playing there and so on they're playing an active role in providing leadership i think the operative word is sort of reinvention that will be a mm -hmm. more uh, more operative than rebuild and i think a lot of businesses are going to have to read envision how they how they reinvent themselves and i hope that local consumers will give a disproportionate emphasis to mom and pop shops mm -hmm. maintaining uh, the core of their own community because you have to remember that that in many ways the terms of the of the shutdown were very unfair which is to say that if you were a mom and pop shop selling tapestries on main street um, and Target sells the same tapestries. Target was able to remain open through the entire time because mm -hmm. they also sell groceries. Right. So they were deemed essential while you were deemed non-essential. And so there's been a number of egregiously unfair um, aspects of the situation that have impacted them disproportionately. So I would hope that local consumers would remember that. I know my wife and I have made a practice of, of ordering out from mm -hmm. local restaurants. We've received excellent meals, but it's a way of keeping the community dollars in the community and dealing with those people who provide support for the local ac academic and athletic teams, et cetera. And uh, it's a way of reinvesting in the community that I hope people will, will really put into good practice. Definitely. I think we're also looking at a, a time moving ahead where uh, more business is just done online. So... We are out of time, but I really want to thank you for making time. Uh, I know you're a busy man to call in and to talk about these issues, and uh, I'd love to have you back in, in a month or two so we can kind of see where we are with the county budget and all of that. The time always passes too quickly. I know. I thank you. Welcome to the best. All right. Have thanks so time. much, Gary. Take care. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right. We are awaiting our second call. And uh, I just want to say a word while we're waiting for that a bit more about uh, the KDRT programmers. I, I've been mentioning this the last couple of weeks, but I really want people to know that it's taken a lot of work on their part to learn how to use new tools and, uh, and really whole new skill sets to produce remotely uh, radio shows remotely from home using their computers. And uh, it, it's not the same as doing what I'm doing, which is strolling in and flipping a switch and talking into a microphone. So just hats off. This is community radio at its best. And we have our call coming in. So operating since 1976, Progress Ranch is an intensive treatment program providing high-quality mental health services to boys 
ages 6 to 14, who, as a result of dysfunctional family relationships, can't function in a normal home environment. Progress Ranch has two homes with six beds each located in residential neighborhoods in Davis, California. And my guest is their executive director, Wendy Kunta. Hi there, Wendy. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. Nice to hear your voice. So I just read your mission statement, but tell us a bit more about Progress Ranch. How, how do boys get referred to you and what kind of care and services do you provide? So the boys are referred to us through their local counties, and most of um, our boys are um, have been in the foster care system for many years and have not been successful in the family um, environment and mm-hmm. need more uh, services and mental health services and, and a structured environment to help them. And then our goal is to get them back either with their family or with a foster family. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of parents out there who are dealing with teaching one or several kids at home during this time of distance learning, but you've got that <laughs> in, in volume. So how are you, how are you managing all the, the intricacies of that right now? Yeah, that's been very, very difficult with uh, six boys in each house. And the majority of my staff are young adults who aren't parents. Mm-hmm. And so this is like a crash course <laughs> into becoming a parent. And um, we're lucky enough that we have, uh, you know, paraeducators from Davis Joint Unified who work with us, so mm-hmm. they're not, you know, so they understand the system and they're able to help, um, you know, during this time, um, you know, because they're working, they're not able to work through Davis Joint Unified, but they're also Progress Ranch employees. Mm-hmm. So it's been kind of a good relationship in that way. But, um, you know, on top of all the distant learning schedules, we're also managing all the boys have CASA workers, get, you know, visits, mm-hmm. family visits, therapy visits. Uh, county worker visits, so we're spending a lot of time on Zoom, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of time on, on, you know, scheduling Zoom visits. <laughs> right, which doesn't do a lot to help. I, I don't know your current uh, crop of boys, but I've met a lot of them in the past, and they are, you know, bouncing off the walls, energy, so sitting in front of a computer is, is I imagine, is not a good match there. No, it's been extremely difficult, and, you know, we've gotten creative with, you know, trying to find things for them to fidget with in their hands and putting them in different spaces in the house or even in the backyard, you know, with headphones on. Um, You know, I think, you know, one benefit is, you know, with my staff is they're very creative in in trying to find, you know, the best resources and, and working things out the best they can. Yeah. So a, a number of people this week have been bringing up the, the topics of stress and anxiety among our kids and our youth. So uh, I imagine that's an extra burden as well. Definitely. I, you know, all my boys come already with, right. you know, so much stress and anxiety and a background of trauma and, you know, having that, that brain, you know, system that has had so much trauma that, you know, they don't deal with stress and anxiety very well already. Yeah. So this just increases it. And, you know, they're, and they're also kids. You know, the, my, my youngest is seven and my oldest right now is 13. They don't understand what's going on there or understand why they can't see their family in person or why staff come in wearing masks. And, um, you know, so trying to make it, um, you know, I, I think fun and bringing in lots of activities, which I think a lot of families in Davis are doing, you know, uh, you know, having the stuffed animal on the window and mm-hmm. doing the chalk art out front and, you know, um, just trying to be, feel like part of the community and that we're all in this together has been really helpful. Yeah. So I, I've said this a lot on this show. We all know that right now all nonprofits need financial support. But I know that Progress Ranch, you, you have a long list on your website of specific needs. But, but let's talk about how people can support you um, in, in different ways right now. Well, I think some, you know, in the beginning it's been so great. The Davis community has always been amazing for us. You know, I can put something on Facebook like, we need new DVD movies, and people are dropping it off. Mm-hmm. And, and we've seen the same here, you know, uh, with as soon as the first week hit, I had puzzles and board games and, you know, um, uh, lots of outdoor activities. So 
you know, all that is still needed because our boys run through it. You know, a, mo- a Monopoly game turned <laughs> that was dropped off two weeks ago, I guarantee it doesn't still have all its pieces. Well, let's hope so, Leah Rosenberg is listening, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's great. Well, she, actually, we just talked today about dropping Legos off into one of the houses. Of course. So, <laughs> yeah, she, she's definitely good about that. And, um, you know, so for us, you know, I have a, you know, Amazon um wish list that includes a lot of those things but a lot of people don't have to buy things new you know you yeah. have you have a lot of families that kids are growing out of you know their skateboards or their bicycles mm-hmm. and those are all things that we can use um the kids uh, started a garden and we had some uh local uh you know neighbors drop off some some starters mm-hmm. you know and i think just we we try to keep up on facebook so you know i'm, I'm constantly putting things that we're looking for or that we need. Um, we had a couple of families go to donut, go get donuts and drop them off on a Friday morning. Right. And, again, it just adds to the kids feeling like they haven't been forgotten, mm-hmm. you know, that they're, the community wants to be there for them, even in this time. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's all about the small kindnesses. Well, I've I've always thought this about you. You're you're a bit of an angel with the work that you do, and the work that your your staff does, and the and how you support the boys. So, uh, tell us. So you're on Facebook, and also uh, your website is. Let Let's let people know about that. It's um it's uh, progressranch.com. So www.progressranch.com. Okay. And you know, I definitely need to say that you know that the angels right now are my staff because they didn't miss a beat. As soon as the shelter in place, you know, when it came down, they still show up for work. And yeah. we're talking about young adults who are making minimum wage right. and, you know, go there every day. So, you know, I, I, I feel a lot for them because they, they're putting in a lot of work right now with those boys. All right. Well, thanks so much for calling in, Wendy. Sure. All right. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. And thank you for tuning in. I will be back next Tuesday, keeping this up Tuesdays and Fridays through the end of the month and then going to Tuesdays only in June from the KDRT studio. I'm Autumn Labbe-Renault, and this has been the COVID-19 Community Report.